Friends, we are starting into a new sermon series here today called Quotable. We are going to be looking at some of the most famous and most iconic scriptures in the Bible. And I debated whether or not I would tell the story, but the way that we got into this series is a few months ago I was driving around, or a few weeks ago I was driving around, and I heard a really bad sermon on the radio. So when I, I got a new car last year, and it came with a trial of satellite radio, and I never listened to satellite radio, but it was actually pretty good, and so I, you know, listened to satellite radio all the time and got excited about it, and then my trial ended, and I said, well, that was fun, but I'm not, I'm not paying for this. And so I went back to, you know, standard normal radio full of commercials, and I'm scanning through because my truck didn't have the radios preset into the stations, and so I'm just scanning through, and I don't know if you've just scanned through the radio stations recently, but it's wild. Um, but I came across a religious station, like, first out of the gate. And I was like, oh, interesting, a radio sermon. Let me, let's see what they have to say. And it was awful. I mean, it was so bad. Have you ever just heard something where you just, you just you want to cringe and crawl and jump through the car radio and say, don't, don't listen to this maniac. And it was awful and awful, but it was kind of like a car crash. You couldn't look away. So I probably listened to this for 15 minutes. Um, it, was really, it was really brutal. So I was like, okay, enough of this. Go into the next station. And lo and behold, it was another sermon. It's like, all right, well, this was entertaining for a little bit before, but this one was different. It was not total garbage. And as I listened to it, I found myself being drawn in, and I thought, man, when was the last time I just listened to a sermon? That sounds weird, because I'm a preacher, but I'm usually doing it. And so it's odd to sit there and listen to a sermon, and I was really inspired by it. And he was talking about John 3.16, and he was having a conversation. He was telling a story about a conversation he had with a colleague, and he said, you know, I've never preached from John 3.16. He said, I've been in the ministry for 40 years, and I've never preached from John 3.16. And his friend said, yeah, me either. He said, why do you think that is? He said, I don't know. What are you going to say about it? It's John 3.16. Everybody knows it. It's kind of scary. It's one of those things like, do you need to talk about it? And if you do, what in the world would you even say about it? And as I'm driving down the freeway, I said, you know, I've never preached about John 3.16 either. I don't think I've heard anyone preach about John 3.16 in my life. And yet, it's like a ubiquitous scripture. So many people know it. And so I thought, you know what, let's look at some of these iconic scriptures. And then I sat down to write this sermon, and I said, what have I done? Why would I decide to take this on? And so it was an interesting journey to get to where we are today. But we never really preach on these famous texts, but everyone knows them. And so I thought it might be a good idea to look at them and see, what do they really say? What do we believe about these words that most of us have heard, and even many Non-Christians, people across the world have heard or seen made reference to. So I want to read it here, and then we'll jump into it. This is in your uh, bulletin as well. I'm just going to read that famous passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. God, I ask that you would speak to us here today. Help us to better understand these words that we have heard countless times. These words that we see on posters at football games, we see as a part of political campaigns, church advertisement. We see them on the walls of our homes and decorations and coffee mugs. We see these words everywhere. But sometimes we don't take a moment to actually ask ourselves, what does this mean? So, Lord, open your word up today so that we might better understand this iconic scripture. Teach us and we will listen. This is your house and we trust you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. So getting to this passage, when we came into the series, I said, I'm just going to Google what are the most famous scriptures. And John 3.16 was at the top of every list. Number two was Psalm 23, so we're going to look at that next week. But John 3.16 was universally, the lists were kind of different once you got down past the first couple, but everybody had John 3.16 at the top of their list. And one of the main sources for that were sports. You see John 3.16 show up in sports all the time. It's on people's posters they hold up. But one of the most famous instances of John 3.16 showing up comes from a famous quarterback named Tim Tebow. You may know this story about Tim Tebow. Tim was a uh, college football quarterback for the University of Florida, and then he went on to play in the NFL. And he was very famous for being outward about his faith, a very polarizing figure. Some loved that, some hated him for it. Very polarizing, but he was very outward about his faith. Wore his Christianity, I would say on his sleeve, but literally on his face. 
So football players, to block out the glare on bright sunny days, will wear what's called eye black. It's either paint or a, or a strip of black cloth that goes under your eyes, and it prevents the glare from getting you so bad. And a lot of players will write something on that. And he wrote a verse from Philippians, I think it was Philippians 4.13, on his eyes the whole season long in the 2009 season. And then when they came to the national championship, because they were a great team that year, and they made it to the national championship the night before, he had a feeling that he needed to change it. He said, I'm just feeling like God is telling me to put John 3.16 on my eye black this week and instead of the verse I've used every other week. And so he made this plan, and he told his parents, and his parents said, well, have you told Coach Meyer? He said, well, why? He said, well, you know Coach Meyer. And if you don't know, Urban Meyer was the coach of Florida at the time, and he is a very superstitious man. So Tim would tell all these stories about, you know, if they wore long socks and they won, the socks were longer next week. I mean, whatever was working, he would roll with the superstitions. And so he said, okay, I'll go tell him. And so Tim rolls into Urban Meyer's office and says, you know, coach, I'm going to change the scripture on my eye black. And Urban Meyer said, are you crazy? Do you want us to lose? Why would you betray me like this? So Tim explained, he just felt that that's what, you know, he needed to do, and he was probably never going to have as big of a stage as this moment, and he just thought that that's what God was calling him to do, and Coach Meyer said, okay, you know, I, I don't agree with it, but I understand, and so he let him change it. They had this huge game, they won in overtime, it was this incredible national championship game, and that game, over 90 million people Googled John 3.16, and after the game, Tim found out about this, and he said, how the heck did 90 million people not know what John 3.16 says? It's like, well, it's a big world out there, Tim. <laughs> so fast forward three years later, he's playing in the NFL for the Denver Broncos, and they're in a playoff game. And at the end of the game, they have this crazy game that goes into overtime, and they win, and the PR guy for the team comes up to him afterwards, and he says, Tim, do you realize that it's exactly three years to the day since you wore John 316 on your eyes in the national championship? He's like, oh, that's crazy. He's like, yeah, I mean, especially considering what happened in this game. Tim said, oh, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't think that you knew what had happened. But in this game, you threw for 316 yards. Your yards per rush was 3.16. Your yards per completion was 31.6, which was an NFL record, by the way. CBS, that broadcast the game, their ratings were 31.6. And Pittsburgh, the Steelers, the team they were playing, their time of possession was 31.06. Tim said, whoa. He said, yeah, not only that, John 3.16 has been Googled over 90 million times, and it's the number one topic trending on Facebook and Twitter. And Tim looked at him and said, you know, I bet a lot of people will say that's a pretty crazy coincidence. And then he walked away. And I think about that a lot. It makes me wonder, how does God work? Is God really manipulating the statistics of a quarterback during a football game? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's wild. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm a football fan. I think that God is too. So maybe. I mean, I don't know. You'd think that he would use it for the Lord's team and give it to the Cowboys, but I don't know. That seems weird for me to stand up and say, yes, I believe that God influenced every stat in that game and the broadcast numbers so that it would align with this and people would remember that three years ago he wore this on his eyes and they would come to Google it and they'd read the words of John 3.16 and they would come to Christ. That seems like a stretch, doesn't it? But I don't know. How does God work? I don't know. But you can't deny something crazy happened in that game. And this scripture that was already iconic, already the most famous scripture in all the Bible, became even more famous through Tim Tebow. The first thing I've learned about these iconic scriptures as I've been searching about them is that they have this incredible power to spread and make a huge impact. It's easy to remember John 3.16. It's quick and it's short. A lot of people know the phrase John 3.16 even if they don't know what it says. It's easy for those things to spread. We hear them all the time. 90 million Google searches happened during both of those games because Tim chose to use his platform to spread a message of the gospel. So we know that these have immense power. But something I've also learned about these iconic scriptures is that we don't all interpret them the same way. When we read John 3.16, we don't all read the same thing. We don't all see those words. They don't all impact us in the same way. Not every church is using them in the same way. We don't all interpret the scripture in the same way. 
And so if this is the most famous scripture in the Bible, and most of us know it, what does it mean? Because this isn't a small scripture. It's not something that's really self-explanatory on the surface. Like Jesus gives us the greatest commandment, love God and love your neighbor. That's pretty straightforward, right? Love God and love your neighbor. How do you do that? Well, that gets a little more complicated, but that in and of itself is not super complicated. But this scripture is different. It's talking about the will of God and the incarnation of Christ, the atonement, salvation, discipleship. It's a huge scripture. So what does it mean? Well, I'm going to take a moment this morning to look at the context of John 3.16, because while we all know that verse, I would bet $1,000 nobody in this room can tell me what John 3.15 says, because we don't read that, right? We know 3.16. We don't know what comes after it or before. So the third chapter of John, at least in the first half, where we find this iconic scripture, is a story of Jesus having a conversation with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. That's where this scripture shows up. The Pharisees, we talked about a lot before, the Pharisees get a bad rap. The Pharisees are often cast as the villains of the story of Jesus, right? They're the empire. They're the evil overlords. They're the villains because we're used to watching movies where there are good guys and bad guys, right? The Pharisees wear the black hats. That's how we've cast them. But that's not what the Pharisees were at all. They were, some would say, the most faithful group within Judaism. They had a strict adherence to the law. They prayed more, they tithed, they were probably more disciplined and faithful in their actions than any of us are, because that's what their whole religion was about, following the law perfectly. If the law was ambiguous, they'd write a new law. They were strict adherents to the law. They were incredibly faithful, and they were leaders within Judaism. The problem they had is they took that too far. They forgot the point of the law, and they took the law so far that they were causing harm and hurting people, and they were very judgmental because it all became about who was following the law better than others. That's how you were seen to be faithful. And so it led to a lot of judgment and a lot of harm because they took it too far. So this is Nicodemus. He's one of these Jewish Pharisees. And Nicodemus goes to Jesus in the middle of the night to have this conversation with him. Now he goes in the middle of the night because he couldn't have this conversation in public. Jesus was not popular among the Jewish leaders. They thought that he was a false teacher, a false messiah, that he was inciting rebellion, and they were against him. They worked against him, and they eventually had him put to death. So Nicodemus, as a leader within Judaism, can't go and talk to this outsider, this rebel, this troublemaker, this false god. He can't have that conversation. It would risk his reputation. It would risk his standing. Because Nicodemus was not only a Pharisee, he was also a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish tribunal. It was one of the leading councils within the Pharisee group. And so he is a leader By all reckoning, he is a leader within Judaism. So he can't go and have this conversation with this guy. So he goes at night, and he has this conversation with Jesus. Because while the Pharisees all believe that Jesus is a false prophet and that he is the enemy, Nicodemus isn't convinced. Nicodemus has seen him work. He's seen his miracles. He's listened to him preach. And he says, I don't... I don't, I'm not sold on that yet. There's something about you. God has to be with you or you couldn't do all of these things. And so Nicodemus wants to learn more. And so he goes and he has this conversation with Jesus. Now this story is only in the Gospel of John. We don't find it in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And that's because of why John wrote his Gospel. We've talked about this a lot too. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the story kind of like a biography. And John wrote more like a sermon because John wants us to really understand doesn't just want to tell us the story of Jesus. They already had that. He wanted people to really understand who Jesus was because they misunderstood Jesus in his time so much that they had him executed. They didn't get who Jesus was, and even 100 years later in the time of John, they still didn't get who he was. And so John writes this gospel so that we would really understand who he is. And so the story fits right in. Because this story undermines this anti-Jesus narrative the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees had. They can't let this story get out. But it's perfect for John. John is saying even one of the Pharisees, even one of the group that worked to have him killed, even one of those leaders saw something different in Jesus and went to have this conversation. Jesus is even there and he helps Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus. He follows him all the way until the end. Nicodemus is transformed by this encounter with Christ. And so they have this conversation, and the crux of their conversation is Jesus is trying to explain to Nicodemus that everything's not about judgment and the law, like the Pharisees think it is, that they've missed the point, 
God is about love and bringing abundant and eternal life. And the Pharisees have missed that point. And Jesus is trying to explain this to Nicodemus. And so in John 3, 17, right after our famous scripture, he says these words. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He's trying to say it's not about judgment and rules like you've built everything up to be. I didn't come to judge. I came to set people free from judgment. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. The reason these words are so famous is because they essentially summarize the message of the gospel in one sentence. That's why people like it so much. If you could only give people one sentence or one verse to explain Christianity, this is the one you would go to. It summarizes what it is, and it summarizes it because Jesus is trying to summarize to Nicodemus why he's there. He tells Nicodemus, you and the Pharisees have missed the point. It's not about judging others or following the law perfectly. It's about love, which is what the law was supposed to teach you how to do, but you messed it up. You misunderstood why we gave you the law in the first place, and so that's why I'm here. I'm here because the law isn't working, you've misunderstood it, you're causing harm, and so I'm here to explain it, to set you straight, and to demonstrate what that looks like. That's why Christ came to earth. God loves so much that God is willing to sacrifice himself for us, willing to die so that we might have abundant life and to love others, not so that we would judge others. But the Jewish leaders didn't like the idea of giving up their power. And their power was derived from their perfect following of the law, being able to judge others as less than. That was their source of their power. And they didn't want to give up their power or their judgment, so they opposed him. And that's why Jesus has this conversation with Nicodemus. And a hundred years later, people still didn't want to give up their power and their judgment to love other people, so John wrote a gospel and included this story in it so we might understand. And 2,000 years later, people today still don't want to give up their power or their judgment and love everyone. So that's why we continue to talk about this today. It's why these words are so famous. It's why they have such power. Because we keep making the same mistake. These words are still relevant to us today. We keep fighting the same battle today. We continue to choose power and judgment and self-interest over love. John 3.16 is the most famous verse in the Bible. But unfortunately, when a lot of people hear, hear the words of John 3.16 or see that scriptural reference somewhere, they don't think of God's unconditional love. They think of the institutional church because the scripture is tied to the church for most people. And the institutional church has caused a lot of damage. The church can be very judgmental. The church can be very segregated. The church can be very harsh. It can be really difficult. A lot of people walk into church and they don't feel good enough. They feel like they're being judged. That's what people often see. They feel that judgment and condemnation. The same judgment and condemnation the Pharisees used to harm others and have Jesus put to death. But that's not the message of Christ. And that's what this whole conversation is about. That's what this whole scripture is about. Christ came to earth so that we would understand that. Because they kept getting it wrong. And John wrote a gospel. Because even a hundred years later, they still didn't understand the point of Christ. And they were still fighting this battle. And today, we're still fighting that battle. It's our job as followers of Christ to tell the world that God is not defined by judgment and condemnation. Those are the mistakes that we in organized church leadership have made. Those are the mistakes that we as flawed human beings who have a hard time loving people who are different than we are. As flawed human beings who like power and want to be right and want to have control. We have caused that damage. And it's our job to set that record right like Jesus is trying to do with Nicodemus. To remind people that God is defined by unconditional love and grace for all people. That's the message of hope that Christ came to deliver. That's the message of hope that we find in John 3.16. And it's our job to share that message of hope with others. Whether we write it on our face or we just tell our friends about it, it's our job to get that message of hope out. Because it's been a message of judgment and pain for so many people for a very long time. We want to make sure people know that our God is a God of hope and love, and we're doing our best to follow that as well. Let's pray. God of love, we come to you today looking at words that are very famous to us and yet having a hard time living them out. 
We know that you are a God of love, but we often see churches that cause harm. We see churches fighting with one another. We see the battle of religion and politics play out each and every day. There's a lot of animosity to the point where religion is one of the things we can't talk about at dinner because we've lost this. We've lost the core of what the scripture says, oh God, that you loved us so much that you were willing to do anything, even go to the cross and die for us. You were willing to do anything so that we would know that this love is real and that we were created to love and to live in community, to support and care for one another, not to judge, not to fight for power, not to seek to harm others so that we might gain. So God, help us. Help us to see through the pain that we may have experienced. Help us to see through the messiness of religion in our world and to see to your words as if we were coming to you at night like Nicodemus, trying to learn more. Help us to see your message of hope so that we might spread that message to a world who deeply needs it. Be with us, O oh God. In your name we pray. Amen.